Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a really interesting guest coming in from California. Uh, you might have been hearing a lot of things. Uh, I've heard this for over the years, a lot of people saying things like, your real name is capitalized and your not real name is not capitalized and you're, you're actually owned and your birth certificate is uh, actually part of, you're part of a corporation and the US is part of a corporation. This is something I've actually never really looked into. Uh, but our next guest is a, is a, a total expert on, he's actually spent 25 years looking into all these things very deeply to the point where he's actually started up his own private society called Pantera and he actually has his own university called Gemstone University where he teaches people how they've become enslaved through this entire system and how the entire system works and most interestingly to our audience is how to actually remove yourself from this system uh, as well his name's Kenneth Scott and as well he'll be coming to Anarchapoco he's a sponsor of Anarchapoco and so he'll be there so if you have any questions you want to ask him about uh, how to deslave yourselves, how to remove yourself from the system. Uh, he apparently uh, has uh, information on how to do that. And we're going to hear all about what this is all about, because a lot of this is very new to me. Uh, but I've heard it a lot. And actually, a lot of people uh, who have been registering for Narcopoco, they put their name and then they say house of something. And I was like, oh, this is, must be some weird little new kind of cool thing that kids are doing or something. But this is all kind of related to what Ken is talking about. So we're going to get into all of that with Kenneth Scott in just a moment. But before we begin, though, Kenneth, I have to ask you, how did you become an anarchist? <laughs> uh, good question, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have to really say that I became one because I was born as one. Uh, I've had this passion since a very early age. Uh, literally, when I was three, four, five years old, I had a sense that something was distinctly wrong in the world that I was born into. And at an early age, uh, I had several passions. One was a passion to learn everything about everything. Secondly was a passion to learn it so that I could figure out a solution why or with what I learned how we could do something different. Ultimately as I grew up and then I entered into my research as you mentioned for the last 25 years I came to understand the exact nature of how we are in bondage and with that I came to understand what I truly know is the only way for us to be a true anarchist. Because the word anarchist means no power, no arc of power above us. Monarch means one power above us. And so an anarchist means between me and all of creation, there is nothing above me, beside me, below me that has any authority to control or dominate my life or my life force and all of that. So truly, I've been an anarchist my entire life because I believe in absolute freedom, not partial freedom, absolute freedom. Me too, and uh, of course, I've been talking about this for years and uh, and talking about all the different angles on anarchy and stuff like that, but I've never gotten into, I, I've seen it all over the place. I see people talking about it all the time about how your birth certificate is actually your own by the, the uh, corporation of the US and that corporation is part of another, cor it's, it's very confusing to me and I've never really looked into it. So we've got you here to explain it all to us. So what is this, how, what is this entire system we've somehow been uh, trapped into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me start with this. <clears throat> did, you ever, did you ever do jigsaw puzzles in your life? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> you know how a jigsaw puzzle, you have to study the whole picture. They give you the picture on the cover. But to really get down to the depths of how to put it together is like three, four, five different layers. There's the shapes of the pieces, there's the color nuances, there's the image, there's all kinds of things that you have to correlate. And our brains are very well um, capable of seeing the multidimensionality of something. Now, imagine that you took 10 very complex jigsaw puzzles and you threw all the pieces together in one big box. That's how complex the jigsaw puzzle of this world is. So one of the areas that I've focused on in my studies for literally almost my entire life is esoteric uh, metaphysical concepts. The key to understanding this world system is that those who control it, the elite, the bloodlines, all of what you know, we're familiar with in general, are trained in esoteric sciences. 
And in that esoteric science are the structures of systems, geometry, numerology, um, language, all of that. And our entire world system, law, money, everything is based on the esoteric arena. So when I say we take a big box of multiple uh, jigsaw puzzles, the esoteric science gives somebody the ability to see these multi-dimensions. Because one of the, the key maxims when you're trained in esoteric science is everything is hidden in plain sight. Okay, so we see all these symbols from the obelisk to the pyramid to two pillars, cross, all these symbols. They have specific application and specific meaning. So uh, it's a mass jigsaw puzzle. One must understand all of that and see it. And that's what's meant by having eyes to see in order to see the reality of the system and the world that, that we're in. That's the key to the code of the matrix. So where does this all begin? Uh, so you're saying that this is all sort of a structure that's been put in place for hundreds of years, Thousands uh, and of that years. Uh, hardly anyone, yeah, and hardly anyone, myself included, knows anything about it. Um, so where did this all begin, and who who designed all this? And what what's going on? What's the story? <laughs> okay, good question. Uh, it really goes back to Egypt and I'm sure well before that, but for our purposes, we could say Egypt five to 6,000 years ago. Through Egypt and Sumer and Babylon, Babylon, I'm sure you've heard of reference to the money system as a Babylonian debt magic system. Okay, there's specifics to that. And literally this has been hardwired in everything of the last 5,000 years. Ultimately, all the way back then, there was only one system. It was basically what we would, for lack of a better word, call religion, okay? Religion, by the definition of the word, means to bind again, relig. Ligir is the Latin word that means to bind. So it is all about how do we bind the population of this world to become essentially our slaves. And so religion broke into many subdivisions politics, social structures, economics, legal systems, monetary systems, and so forth. But it all does get back to that root point. And at the root in the esoteric understanding of Egyptian, Sumerian, Babylonian systems, which Rome certainly implemented because it's one continuum ever since then. There's never been any, you know, oh, it's a new empire, it's a new system. No, it's always been one system. And so the root of that in terms of the symbols is um, if you look at buildings, you look at the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the, all the buildings in Washington, D.C. and New York, in New York, they have one primary symbol, which is two pillars and an arc. The arc is called a mantle. And so when we talk about anarchy, the word arc designates the source of power. That's why monarch means a monarchy, a singular power. So there are two pillars in an arc, and the esoteric relationship to that is those two pillars represent two lineages. One is the line of the king, the other is the line of the priest. And that is the entirety of how the world is controlled because the priest is how the bondage through legal systems, the law of the priest basically, are contractually bound and binding to all of the world population. And then the line of the king is the king is the singular authority that holds the land. All land is held by the crown. So our world system today has reproduced that. We have the Vatican City, which controls both sides. It is the arc that controls both sides against the middle. The crown that's held in the city of London controls all land all monetary issue through the banking system. They control the, you know, the London fix through the gold and all of that. They control everything of how the binding nature of the legal system attaches to the creation of what we call money. The law of the priest determines the relationship of the binding legal structure to our living substance, our, our body, our life force, our entire output of production from birth until death. And so 
without going to detail because we don't have time here, but this is what we teach in Gemstone University. The, the fundamentals is understanding how we have been lifted off the land and put into a containment field. That containment field is the binding nature of the money system through and by the legal system as essentially a globally expressed law of the priest. And we have many priesthoods, but you know we could say the medical priesthood, the financial priesthood, the, the religious priesthood, but it's all set up as a religious, uh, ecclesiastical world system that binds us to the, to the law of the priest. And when we are bound to that law, we are beholden and controlled by that law. And that's the key. So we can get into that a little bit more as we go along. So who is it that is designing all this system and how has it stayed in place for thousands of years without hardly anyone knowing about it? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, you've heard of, you mentioned earlier and, and before we started recording, you asked about, you know, calling my name Kenneth Scott of the House of Cousins and you've heard other people do that. Well, what do we know about houses? We've got the House of Rothschild, the House of Windsor, we've got the House of many, many nations. I mean, not nations, but uh, private, private families. That is counterposed or separated from how the world population is put into the containment field that I've mentioned. So those houses go back literally thousands of years. Uh, and you know, if you look at the Bible and you take away the religious overlay, you can actually see the layers of the system of how commerce is constructed, how the binding nature of, of what I've talked about is constructed. And that, that document, that book, was based on previous structures, again, going all the way back to, to Egypt. And, you know, to answer your question, there are lineages, there are bloodlines that have always controlled the story. They put that story into religious terms, they put it into secular terms. Today the movies are the purveyor of the story. And if you know how to look at it, you can see all of this running through. It's literally when, when Neo woke up in the movie The Matrix and he could see the, the flowing of the code, nothing could touch him. Remember at the end of the first movie the agents tried to attack him? But he was now in control of the code of the matrix. The code of the matrix is the legal system, the monetary system, the religious system, all of the nature of, of what we're talking about. How we are bound and bonded as what I said earlier before we started recording, which we should get into in, this, uh, in the interview, is our real status is we are a bonded surety to a bankrupt franchise. And so we have to define what that really means. Please do. <laughs> okay. Uh, remember I said religion is to bind again. Okay. First of all, you understand what a bond is, correct? More or less, yes. Okay. Well, a corporation issues a bond. It has mm -hmm. assets. It can bond its assets and issue that bond as a instrument of debt, correct? Right. Okay, so that's a bond. Somebody has to underwrite that bond, which is the nature of insurance, the, innate, the nature of secured interest and security um, when a security such as a bond is issued by a corporation. So underlying that, that underwriter is some base of, of value that assures the, the delivery of the, um, what's being insured should there be a default. So a corporation can issue bonds. Um, it should technically issue them up to the level of its available um, unencumbered assets. Of course, we know they issue them <laughs> uh, way in excess of that. But that describes basically um, a bonded surety. What is the collateral that assures the, the, the value that's issued or bonded or securitized with that instrument? So I said a bankrupt franchise. What does that mean? 
Well, we know that every country in the world has a central bank. Virtually, there's a few that aren't. That central bank is a bank of issue. And what does it issue? It issues a money system that is monetized debt. How is that debt underwritten? It's underwritten because each debtor is a subdivision of that master corporation called the United States or Canada or Mexico or whatever that nation is, which tells you that every nation in this world is actually a corporation. And so the central bank can wrap, just like a corporation wraps its assets and issue bonded debt that's gonna circulate as currency. So we essentially have volunteered to be the bonded surety to the franchise that is a corporate, the subdivision of a corporation that is issuing monetized debt, which we call money, Federal Reserve notes, Canadian dollars, whatever the case may be. So that requires us to describe or, or define how did these corporations get into bankruptcy? That's a very long story, so I'm going to shut it down, uh, uh, boil it down to a very succinct statement. The United States that we know today was formed as a corporation in 1871. There were previous corporations created, and in fact, the United States as we know it today started its life in 1789 as a bankrupt and has continued to be put through reorganization over the last 220, 30 years. So that 1871 corporation began to expand its corporate business. It took upon itself bonded liabilities through the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. And by 1933, it was bankrupt. So it had to be reorganized. This is what FDR called the New Deal. And when FDR came into office, Within three days, an act was passed by Congress called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. And that act gave the executive complete authority to operate under emergency rules and essentially what's called war powers, which goes back to Lincoln and the Civil War. So that's the United States being bankrupt, which it has been ever since March 9th of 1933. In the reorganization, it was given the ability to how to administer and, and run the debtor in possession of the United States and how to remonetize it. The way it remonetized it, it brought all the persons and all the property of the entire body under its authority and started bonding it through the mechanism that I described. The way that was done was the issuing of franchises. So every corporation is a franchise, every LLC, every municipal corporation, every county, every board of education, they're all corporations, they're all franchises, and every single one of them create debt. Every instrument that's ever issued in those franchises, so we'll take my name, the franchise is in all capital letters. Those, that franchise is considered a vessel in commerce and a debtor facility through which and by which monetized debt can be issued. Every time a contract or a bill or anything is issued in the name of that franchise, it is a monetary instrument. Underlying that is also many layers of derivative bonds. So for example, if I get a traffic ticket and I'm brought into court and the fine is $300, there are bonds issued in the millions against that $300 debt. So they're hypothecating the franchise, the public circulating monetized debt currency, and they're trading these off book in the millions, trillions, and, and huge amounts. And this is how they've built the entire world system. So to boil it down to the essence, we volunteer to be the surety. The franchise is the um, debtor facility through which and by which all of the money as we know it today is created. That's interesting that we volunteered. I always found the old uh, vampire movies and things like that where they can't come into your house unless you invite them in. I've always found there was something more to that than just a funny story or interesting story. So right. how did we volunteer for this unwittingly? 
See, what you just described is a fulfillment of, of what I said earlier, that primary maxim in the esoteric arena, which is hidden in plain sight. Remember the, the 10 jigsaw puzzles all mixed together? It's all hidden in plain sight. And technically, see, in law, for a contract to be valid, there must be a full disclosure, full meeting of the minds. So the way they justify it is, well, there is full disclosure. Nothing is hidden. It's hidden in plain sight because it's fragmented like the pieces of those jigsaw puzzles that are all jumbled together from the untrained eye. But the trained eye knows how to see, like I've mentioned uh, an act, the, the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Well, that ties into another act called the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917. It ties into the 14th Amendment of 1868. It ties into other things, literally hundreds and thousands of years old. They're all tied together and they all create one unified system of, of law and legal structure. So it's not hidden. And so they justify it by saying, you had the ability to see all of this, to know it because we've disclosed it all. We disclose it everywhere. We put it in the movies. We tell you what we're doing. We're telling you what we're going to do. And so you have the ability to properly and timely object to the presumption of consent. Because see, that's how it works. So I'm not the franchise. I'm the bonded surety to the franchise. But if I get called into court and I show up and the bailiff says, okay, I'll rise and is Kenneth Cousins here? And I say, yes, I am. I've just volunteered and allowed them to continue under the presumption of consent. It goes all the way back to birth. And, but see, uh, well, first let me say that this, a lot of this was put in place in the Civil War and right after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment established what involuntary servitude was, but it's perfectly legal to have voluntary servitude. And so therefore, everything has to be by voluntary consent. And let me skip a track and, and go to another puzzle piece. Um, have you ever heard the phrase indentured servant? Of course. Okay. Well, what that refers to is if I'm a grantor of a trust, and a trust has three parties, it's a triangle. You have the grantor who grants a item or many items of value, that's called the corpus, and the in initial grant. Then there's a trustee who has legal title and controls the, the legal aspect of that property. Then there's a beneficiary who has equitable title. This is what's called split title. If there is a split title trust, then you do not own anything in absolute title. And everything in our system is based on trust. Every time they create something, every time we agree to participate, we are creating new trusts. Every time we go into court, a new trust is created. Okay, everywhere. There are billions and trillions of trusts. And so, if a, let's say I'm on a dock in, in England in the 1700s and I want to come to America, but I don't have any money. But what do I have? I have the value of my labor. But I have to hypothecate that labor into the future. Okay, you, I know you're quite familiar with hypothecation and taking value and trading off of it. Well, the basis of that is hypothecating something that I own today and I you know, project it into the future and I am giving a, a monetized value today. So in that instance, I'm on the dock, the only thing I have of value is my labor, but I have to do that over a period of time. Therefore, I will indenture, which means to bond myself into a trust relationship, and I become an indentured servant. That's a voluntary servitude. So I will say to the captain of the ship, if you give me passage to America, I will bind or bond my labor for the next five years and I will work for you and I'll work it off. That's called an indentured servant. We've just created a trust. I'm the beneficiary of it because when it's over, I get to be free. I get to be uh, the possessor of the right to, to exist in America and I will pay for my passage to the ship and the ship owner. 
He is the legal trustee because he holds the indenture of the corpus or the body of the trust, which is actually my body because I have hypothecated my labor. This is the essence of how the whole system works. So the voluntary consent comes from the fact that um, from birth and very soon after birth, first of all, the mother volunteers to abandon the baby and register it into the royal trust. So remember I said the, the, um, the crown holds all the property, all the land, going back to the city of London. Well, our physical bodies are considered a landed estate. So when we register it, the word register is, de is derived from regis, which means royal or regal. Uh, the term real estate actually means the royal estate. Real in Spanish, you know this, means the royal, like El Camino Real, means the royal highway. So real estate is really the royal estate. That's because the crown, as the royal estate, holds all title to all of, of what's pledged or registered into it. So the minute a baby is born, it is registered by the mother and the state considers that the father abandoned the landed estate of this living newborn baby. And we don't have time to get into it in, the, in this interview, but underlying trust law is a state law. And estates have been structured over hundreds and hundreds of years in a manner to, today in the world system, every Thing in terms of property is in an estate. It's either um, uh, non-portable property, which is in the royal estate as real estate, or it's chattel property. So the baby becomes chattel property and is registered into the royal estate, and we are considered to have abandoned that estate, and the executor now becomes the state itself. So the entire system the United States bureaucracy under the administrative procedures of the bankruptcy that I described, and the whole world system, because every national entity is also a corporation that's also bankrupt, that's channeled by and through Washington, D.C. to the city of London. It's all one big corporation and one global estate. The key is that we've abandoned our estates. We did not perfect the estate. And so what we teach, because we've perfected the knowledge of how to do this, is how to correct our status. This is what Pantera as a private society is about. This is what the Gemstone University um, both teaches the detail of what I've described. And we've developed a course called Status Correction. It took us four years already to build this entire course. And it walks our members through every aspect of disconnecting the contractual nexus to being the bonded surety to what I've been describing. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, so if someone were to do something like that and to go through the process to disconnect from the system, uh, what would that mean? What would that, how would that change their life? Well, okay, let me go back to trust law, what I described as the split title. Remember I said that the legal title is held by the trustee. The beneficiary holds the equity, and you understand that, you know, and um, well, let me back up a step and say, we talked about a corporation issuing bonds, but it also can issue stocks. Stocks are what? They're equity in the net value assets of the corporation. Those net, that net value is determined by reducing its external obligations, which includes all of its bonds, correct? So in a trust, you have legal title and you have equitable title. <clears throat> the true owner of a, of a true exclusive equity trust, and there's a reason I use that phrase, is the beneficiary. And the legal title holder, meaning the trustee, is actually the liable party, okay? The trustee has all the debt obligations. It is liable for all of, it, all of its pledged uh, collateral and, and um, obligations, claims, contingent claims, all of that. Why? Because it has legal title to the trust corpus. And so um, right now, the way 
things are supposed to be is the governments of the world are supposed to act as trustees. They're supposed to hold things in trust and take care of the liabilities uh, based on the, the legal title that they hold for the benefit of the equitable interest uh, beneficiary. But what they've done is they've turned things around. So remember when I said that if I walked into the court and the judge says, are you Kenneth Cousins? And I say, yes, well, I have not only volunteered to and consented to their construction, I've also stated by that act that I am the trustee, which means I'm the liable, I'm holding the liability. I have all the debt. I have all of the obligation for the claims, contingent claims, and perfected liabilities against the body or corpus of the value of the trust. And so what we want to do is shift the relationship back to where it's supposed to be. So our status correction process severs the surety relationship, restates the trust, and actually puts the government, the corporation, in the trustee position, and we direct the, the corporation slash trustee and all of the sub uh, public actors, judges, clerks of court, IRS officers, they all become trustees under the master corporate structure uh, with the commander in chief at the top. So many people ask, well, if I disconnect from this franchise, how am I going to do business? You know, I like anarchy, but I also like capitalism. I want to create value. I want to have that value. I want to control it. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, own nothing, control everything, right? Yeah, wasn't that the Rothschilds? Yeah, well, Rockefellers, Rothschilds. One of them. One of them. <laughs> and the secret to that is an integrated, multi-layered strategy in which all of the ownership of the value and the assets is structured between a trust, estate, um, structure and the extensions of that, which can be international corporations or other types of entities. The key is that knowing how to structure that, you can own nothing technically because we don't want to own anything in this current system. If we own it, that means we're the legal title holder, that means we have all the liability. I'd rather have the United States Corporation hold the liability and I, as the director, the controller of that as the beneficial equity holder be able to direct the trustee and say, you pay this, you pay that, you take care of all of that. And that's actually where we've arrived at in our status correction process. We're right at the point where we are compelling the trustee, whether it's a court officer, an IRS officer, or everything, a bank officer, that they hold the legal title, but they're required under that to take care of the, um, the liabilities and we can hold the beneficial interest in a way where we control it all and have none of the liability. So if you went and did something like this, you would, uh, once you'd gone through this process, you would have all your assets in a, some sort of other structure that you don't actually own, you just control somehow through what you do. Um, but does this actually, like for things like taxes and stuff like that, are you saying that if you went through this and you disconnected from this system that you don't have to pay taxes anymore and things like that? Is that what you're saying? Well, let me redefine it with a, uh, a quote from the IRS code. The IRS code is based on one principle, a person liable to pay. Have you ever heard that phrase? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> And I have to tell you that I started, as I said, 25 years ago. My first beginning in studying law was the IRS code. And I've had some friends who have read all 11,000 pages of the code several times through and are absolute experts. And I've studied with them and, and have understood it through that study. But it boils down to that, a person liable to pay. Well, what is a person? A person is a, uh, what is called a juridical personality, which means a fiction in law. The franchise that I described is a person. So when FATCA comes in and they say all U.S. persons are subject to FATCA, it means they control that franchise. Why? Because it belongs to them. It's their property. That's the person liable to pay. But if we're the surety, bonded surety, that has volunteered to 
hold the liability, then we become one and equal with that person liable to pay, and hence we must pay it. But if we turn it around in the way that I briefly described, and we restate that franchise as a private trust, and we establish the public system as the trustee under the commander-in-chief, which brings in a whole other element, which is the military martial law under which we are all in the United States and in the world under right now, um, then they really, um, as I've described, they're the trustee, they hold the liability because they hold the person. They created it, we actually return it to them. See, a lot of people in the law movement and the freedom movement and everything say, well, we want to collapse the trust. We want to destroy the relationship to the social security. And I say, no, I want to perfect it. I want to claim it. When I perfect it, I claim it and I claim the equity behind it. See, right now we have a, a split system. The public system is where all the debt is. This is where everything that I've described exists. But there's another side, the private. If we are a bankrupt attached as a bonded surety to a franchise, we cannot enter the private, okay? We've voluntarily given up our right to stand as a private, truly lawful man as opposed to a public citizen. But if we do the, the process that I've described to you, we actually return the person back to the commander in chief under the military occupation and under the rules that he is bound by, by global international treaty, he must maintain that person. And if we do it as a private trust, then we are the true owner as the beneficial interest holder, the equity. And if I were to say to you, here's a corporation, it's got lots of, lots of assets and lots of debt, which would you rather have? Would you rather be liable for the debt or would you be li like to hold the equity as the assets? I choose the assets. Oh, very good. You passed the first <laughs> test. <laughs> um, that's what we want, not only individually, but collectively. Okay. And so that's, you know, this is, it's more detailed as we get deeper into it. And, um, but that goes back to the answer of your question. How does one take advantage of this? How does one proceed with this? It's simple. Change your relationship to the debtor bankrupt corporation. It's as simple as that. And uh, you help people to understand how to do that through both Pantera and Gemstone, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, the and other thing, do you have any examples of people who have done these things and been successful in removing themselves from the system? Well, the last time I filed a tax return was 1988. I have corresponded with the IRS many ways and many times through the last, what is it, 28, 29 years. Um, uh, the Pantera Society is structured and defined as an ecclesiastical body, which people would say, well, that sounds like a religion. And it's not. You have to go back to the roots of words. Ecclesiastical comes from the Greek Ecclesia, which simply means the body of the congregation. We are living bodies. We can come together with um, a group of people and we create a congregation of multiple bodies as an ecclesia. The entire world system is based, like I said before, on religion. Okay? The United States is actually a religious body. Every city is a religious body. It's all based on ecclesiastical law. And so we are just reproducing it. And so as a private society with an ecclesiastical structure that they cannot refute because that's what the system is. We just know how to claim it and perfect it. So we've created a court. It's an ecclesiastical court which jurisdictionally is superior to every court in this country. Okay, and they know it. So our court is a court of record. We hold the records of everything we do. We've recorded it, we've archived it, and we notice. We've noticed, um, we have a website, PanteraPCA.org. It has all of the public notices that we've sent. We've sent it to the Holy See, to the Vatican, the Lord Mayor of um, City of London, to the President, to the 
uh, Ban Ki-moon at the UN, we gave them notice four years ago. This is who we are. If you have any basis in law to refute, reject, or deny this fact, you have a time to properly do so. They never have. Therefore, when I communicate to the IRS, to courts, I tell them that I'm the Chief Justice of the Court of the Ecclesia of the Pantera de Oro Private Society. And do you know what? When they write back, they write exactly how I tell them to do so. Okay? I tell them that I'm not in the zip code system because that's the corporate system that is part of the binding contract that puts us in that system. And I've got IRS, a state court, federal court, many entities in their system that have acknowledged by writing to me as exactly what I say I am. And so um, we also, you know, we have two uh, premium courses that we, we teach people. One is a status correction. The other is how to create your own society and reproduce what, um, uh, what I've described Pantera is. My goal when I set out to do this was to create a replicatable model that is infinitely replicatable. And so we teach people how to create their own structure, their own society, and it is fully protected by all the way the system is set up. And so, yeah, to answer your question, uh, I haven't filed a tax return in 27 years. Uh, in fact, in recent times, the, the IRS came knocking on my door for something that went back on a, you know, I don't need to go into the detail, but a, a mechanism in which they created a tax liability on my franchise. And I didn't know it was there for a while. I, I then became aware of it. I did certain paperwork that I sent to um, the IRS in Puerto Rico, which is actually the home of the IRS. And then another IRS officer decided to try to re-monetize the franchise. And so he came and he made an offer because everything in the system is based on commercial offer and commercial acceptance. This is how they bind you to their bills and their, their system. I know how to deal with that. And so I reversed it. I actually appointed him as trustee of my master trust and I expressed a individual trust for my IRS account. And I appointed him as a trustee. And even in a meeting that I went to with him in July, when I had, I convened our court as a court of evidentiary record, and we recorded it, and we took all the steps that, that I needed to do, and I appointed him as trustee. And during that conversation, he said to me, or he was recording it for his own record, he said something about the taxpayer, and I said, well, there's no taxpayer here. And then I corrected myself. Oh, I said, well, actually, there is a taxpayer. You, officer, so-and-so are the taxpayer because you are the trustee and you hold the liability. And that was in July. And later in the year, I provided him the means to clear or to extinguish, to settle and close that liability. And he didn't perform on that. So I wrote to Treasury Criminal Investigation and I said, hey, he's the trustee and he's not settling this account. And so they called me up and asked me to come visit them, which I did about a a month ago. And so I've turned it around to make him my trustee. He holds the liability. The exact same thing applies to a court, court officer, a public officer, you name it. Because everything that they're creating in terms of paper, traffic ticket, court case, IRS bill, you name it, is simply another event of monetizing the bankrupt franchise and creating more debt paper to circulate as currency. So the real key here is we're at a tipping point. We have the ability to be true, absolute anarchists, where we remove the overlay of this presumption of consent, this bonded surety relationship to this entire global monetized debt system, and to actually become a true stand man or woman standing with full capacity and that full capacity gives us the ability to do what I've just described, direct the trustees. You take care of it, it's your liability. And so there's many things I've done over the last 25 years 
but it took me 23 years to perfect my understanding of what was the estate? How did trust law come into play? How does equity come into play? How does martial law come into play? How is the emergency banking rules coming into play? All of that. And now we've got it structured and perfected. And we now can become not only the director of all of it, but we can ultimately become the bank because we no longer need to go to them to bind ourselves into their religious, quasi-religious, ecclesiastical construct and, and basically bind ourselves from cradle to grave to be the surety. That's the last thing we want to do. Like you said, do you want the liabilities or do you want the equity? You want the equity. In our status correction, we claim and perfect the holding of the equity. And that's what we all want. And one of us can do it, a thousand of us can do it, millions of us can do it. Once more and more of us do it, then we have more capacity to start actually removing the overlay that, that we're all burdened under, whether we're an expat or living in California. Fascinating. Uh, are you aware of a person named Dean Clifford? Yes. Uh, I don't know much about him, but I've been contacted by him recently. I, I know his name, and I, I know that he was doing some sort of... I, I'm new to all this stuff, so you have to forgive me a little bit, no, but I understood fine. it as... What's that? No, I said, that's fine <laughs> that you're yeah. new to it. That's, uh, yeah, no, all mean, this stuff is new to me. Go no, I was just going to say, I'm excited about your being new to it, because <laughs> it's opening up a whole world that you didn't know existed, and, and all of your your members or listeners or you're not members because you're an anarchist but <laughs> your listeners and, and so <laughs> hey, forth you can so. still have members it just has to be voluntary okay uh, but you're, uh, you're right that's true <laughs> go ahead but the reason Dean. the reason that i'm uh, uh, well, I'll basically tell you what my feeling or thinking of this sort of line of thought was and you've definitely given me by far the best description of uh, this process or this way of getting out of this system that I've heard yet and I know there is other people out there I know there's Dean Clifford was doing something similar and maybe you can explain that to me uh, and I think he was doing something sort of called like sovereign man or sovereign citizen sort sovereign. of an approach to things. Yeah. And he's actually now in jail and I just got an email from him and uh, it's actually from his brother. And uh, they're actually coming to an Arcapoco, uh, his brother and a bunch of people. And they're bringing a bunch of T-shirts about Dean Clifford and an Arcapoco. Mm -hmm. And they actually want to do a Skype live call with Dean in jail, uh, which is interesting. But I, don't, I have to look into it. I don't know much about him. But uh, my question to you is, uh, is, since you do know who Dean Clifford is, was he trying to do something similar to you and he still ended up in jail or was he doing it wrong? Or tell me what, what you think happened there. Well, to be blunt, the ultimate answer is yes, he was doing it wrong. Okay. Let's go back to the original metaphor of seven or eight or ten jigsaw puzzles all mixed up. Every single piece must be in place. Or let's just say just one jigsaw puzzle. You ever do a jigsaw puzzle and you're missing 10 pieces? You know, your dog ate them or something like that. And, um, you know, it's not a complete picture. Or you try to shove a piece that doesn't fit into a hole that's not the proper receptacle. The issue about hidden in plain sight and all of these fragments that individually make no sense is that unless you have the complete picture and how it all dovetails, interrelates, and is a complete picture, you don't have the whole thing. And the system is designed and the parties, the public actors, the judges and so forth are trained to see where there's a flaw. And that flaw gives them a jurisdictional attachment, okay? It's called traversal. Traversal is, you know, you're from Canada, I'm sure you must have gone skiing, and if you're on the mountain, you traverse from one side to the other, right? Well, in law, you can be in one jurisdiction, and just one little thing, one little acquiescence to an offer to contract by the judge traverses you back to the other side, to his jurisdiction, where he controls it. The problem with Dean, and he's, he's, he's a great guy, I've never met him or talked to him, but I've seen his work, it's, it's very advanced, but he's missing pieces. 
And if you're missing all some of the pieces, you don't have the whole picture, you are jurisdictionally attached to their jurisdiction where they can legally and technically pull you in, put you in jail, and all of that. So now you've just opened that up for me to tell you and, and describe the most important piece that everybody misses, okay? The, um, I've mentioned the year 1863, I've mentioned martial law, things like that. We are in martial law in the United States and through the United States Corporation through the rest of the world. That martial law was implemented in the beginning of the Civil War. Then in 1863, Lincoln, um, uh, it's not right word, chartered, contracted, uh, commission, that's the word. He commissioned one of his field officers to create a body of rules for military occupation of occupied enemy territory. That was called, his name was Franz Lieber, and that was called the Lieber Code. And that Lieber Code describes what a foreign military occupier must do under the rules of the United States to maintain m proper military relationship to the civil body and the people of that conquered territory. Okay, So that was issued in 1863. And the war ended, Lincoln was shot, um, the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, and in 1867, something called the Reconstruction Acts were issued. Those created five military districts for the 10 Confederate states. Those states wanted to come back into the original organic constitutional union, which had been dissolved. Okay, the way it was dissolved is because Congress um, adjourned when the states walked out, the southern states. So Lincoln was killed because he destroyed the Union, but he wanted to put it back together. And of course, the Rothschilds who were in control were not going to let that happen. So he was taken out and the Reconstruction Acts established military districts for the 10 southern states. Those southern states never left the military districts, so they have always been under military occupation. Then when um, the 1933 bankruptcy was initiated and the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, that shifted the whole system into emergency war powers, mili full military occupation. That's why the Fed Federal Reserve System has 10 districts. That's why the world is broken up in districts. They are all military districts. So we have to understand military occupation. Then from the Civil War period, you have two very important things that took place. 1899, there was a Hague Convention and a treaty issued. And it's, it's, that treaty defined the nature of war on land. And war on land has to do with when there's a war on land, because everything I've described is the law of the sea. So they have to bring the law of the sea onto the land, and they created a treaty that everybody agreed to, or signatories agreed to that. And the first part of that treaty defined the nature of a belligerent. And it defines a belligerent who is a people who take up arms against an invading force. Okay? That's why you hear, you know, Iraqis or Syrians or Libyans who take up arms as belligerents. It's under this treaty, okay? Next, in 1907, you have another treaty issued that adopted the rules of the Lieber Code, and it made it global or international law to which the United States is bound. And then in that uh, 1907 um, treaty, it states at Article 55 that the military occupier is bound by rules of usufruct. Have you ever heard that word? No. Okay. Usufruct is derives, uh, derived from two Latin words. Usus, which means to use, and fruct or fructose, which means the fruit. What that means is a usufruct is allowed to use the fruit of another's tree. 
Let me define that in military occupation terms. It means the military occupier is authorized under these international treaties to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories under duties and rules of usufruct. So that means the United States as a foreign body, the, the corporation in Washington, D.C., became the military occupier and by 1907 was under the rules of this international treaty structure that gave it full permission, full authority, to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories for military necessity. Okay, so then in, um, well, before I go into that, the other part of the article that I quoted says that if everything is under civil, uh, civil, uh, um, the civil body is maintaining its peaceful relationship with the military occupier, meaning it's not a belligerent. It's not taking up arms against that military occupation. If it does, then the military occupier is bound by the duties of usufruct, and there are five of those. The first one is it must issue a receipt for everything taken from the occupied territory and people. The birth certificate is that receipt. So it takes all the people and property, puts it under each one of our birth certificates. That's the receipt. Secondly, it must issue inventory or take a proper inventory of all the property taken. That inventory is done by the bureaucratic administrative bodies that we know as governments. So now they've taken it under military necessity. They've issued us a receipt. They've given us an inventory which we can access in the system. So now they have the right of usufruct to use the fruit of our labor in order to maintain and uh, continue their military necessity. Thirdly, they must maintain the property in good condition. They must, uh, fourthly, they must pay all fees, taxes, maintenance, repairs, everything to maintain that property. And fifthly, they must return the property to the original owners in proper or improved condition upon the cessation of the military occupation. So what does that translate to? The United States became the military occupier first of the 10 southern states through five military districts by the Reconstruction Acts. It then created a whole body of military function and occupation. The Federal Reserve Act is part of that. So the Federal Reserve note is nothing more than a mil private military script that we're given permission to use under military occupation. They're supposed to maintain everything, but here's the twist. They put, us, put the corporation into bankruptcy. They issued the Emergency Banking Relief Act, declared it a martial law occupation in effect. And from that point forward, any act that was done in the public, which means in commerce, under the rules of the Uniform Commercial Code, which control all securities, all monetary structure, all taxation, things like that, that anything done in the public in commerce is against the law, is illegal, and must be licensed. So that's why we have to get a license to operate in commerce. We have to get a business license, a doctor's license, a contractor's license. All of these are permissions to do something that is technically illegal. If you were to go to a law dictionary, look under the word license, it says permission to do something that's illegal. Okay. So then we get a driver's license and that gives us the ability to be a driver in commerce to operate our commercial franchise. Okay, getting that picture. But if we do anything against their military occupation, then we're considered an enemy of the state. We're considered a belligerent. That's why under the Patriot Act, now we have something called paper terrorism or domestic terrorism. Because the whole public federal military occupation is called the domestic zone. And so if we do something against their military rules, which is the 60 to 80 million codes and statutes in the United States and millions in Canada and Mexico and everywhere else, then we are 
doing something that's technically causing harm to the public. We are considered a domestic terrorist. We are a belligerent and we are an enemy combatant. Okay. This is why every being, every man like Dean Clifford and all the rest of them who I've studied with have ended up in jail because they are still operating under the bonded surety franchise relationship that means that they must comply to all the rules of the military occupation. So commerce is a battlefield. We have to remove ourselves from commerce. It doesn't mean remove ourselves from, from business or enterprise or um, you know, capitalism. It just means we have to stop operating in their playing field because their playing field is a battlefield. And one more point and then I'm gonna turn it back to you. Go back to the 14th Amendment. In the 14th Amendment, it says that the, the public debt cannot be challenged. Well, wait, first of all, in, in section one, it says all persons born or naturalized within the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. That's what defines a U.S. person. Then in section four, it says all the entire national de public debt cannot be challenged as to its validity. It means that as long as you're operating as a public person, a U.S. person, and remember, every nation on the planet is a U.S. person, okay? It is subject to U.S. law, and therefore every citizen in every nation is a U.S. person. They're just not acting on it yet. So if we're subject to their jurisdiction as the bonded surety through the bankrupt franchise, we cannot challenge the debt. We are bonded to it and we cannot challenge it. Secondly, that inviolable nature of that debt obligation extends to, and you can just go, just Google 14th Amendment and read it. You will see it right there. It says, including the obligations for pensions, and bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. This is the key. See, I've seen that phrasing for 25 years. I read it and read it and I kept asking myself, why is that there? You know, it doesn't make sense until I understood the military occupation and everything else that we've talked about. It means that if you're still the bonded surety, and you do something against their millions of codes and statutes, you are considered a belligerent because you're a paper terrorist under the Patriot Act, and you are causing domestic terrorism and harm to the public. As such, you can be suppressed. That suppression can come in the form of a court case, a criminal charge, um, a tax bill, everything you see happening in the United States and in the world is all based on this one construct, military occupation and a belligerent relationship to the military occupier. So the secret of being a true anarchist, an anar anarcho-capitalist, if I could pronounce it right, is to disconnect our bondage to this whole system and move ourselves into the private under the, everything that we teach in Gemstone and Pantera Society and all the rest of it, and become a true living man on the land, which we have the capacity to do. Fascinating stuff. Uh, really looking forward to seeing you at Anarchapoco. That's uh, there's going to be so many amazing people there that. Uh, it's just going to be so interesting to talk to you all in one place. And as I mentioned, I believe uh, Dean Clifford's brother and a bunch of his friends are coming to Narcopoco, and we might even have Dean Clifford uh, Skype in. <coughs> uh, so Good. all kinds of uh, interesting and amazing stuff. Uh, so really looking forward to seeing you here, and I'm sure lots of other people will be very interested in talking to you and hearing more about how they can uh, potentially deslave themselves or, or remove themselves from the system that they uh, didn't know they were even a part of. I didn't even know I was, and uh, still a lot more for me to look into, but this this is uh, very interesting. Glad to get this information so I can look into it for myself. Uh, so, uh, Kenneth, why don't you just finish off? Just let people know where they can find out more information about Pantera or Gemstone University or anything else, any videos you have or blogs or anything like that. Okay, great. Um, as you said, we'll be at, at, at the conference and we have a table as, as a sponsor. 
So we'll, we'll have a, a small contingent there. We look forward to everybody, everybody coming and talking to us. In the meantime, we have two websites, uh, www on both of them, Pantera, which is spelled with two R's, P-A-N-T-E-R-R-A, PCA, which stands for Private Contract Association dot org. So Pantera PCA dot org and Gemstone, just like Ruby Sapphires, etc. Gemstone University dot org. And if you want to get ahead of the curve, you can join us. Um, it's a very simple process uh, on Gemstone. <clears throat> uh, at the upper left, it says join now, become a member. We are only, all of the detail of the education is, is members only. We only operate in the private. So <clears throat> you can become a member, <coughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> before the conference and become familiar with a lot more depth of all this detail that we've covered. <clears throat> and, um, and there you have it. And also we just launched a new YouTube channel under Gemstone University. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. So. <clears throat> so go there. We'll we'll be loading some things over the next two weeks before the beginning of the conference on on the YouTube channel, and and there is quite a bit also on the public side of the Gemstone site. On the Pantera site is our entire body of public notice, uh, our letters to the world bodies, to the Holy See. Um, Lots of very interesting things of our public notices establishing our right to exist as a private society and in a superior jurisdiction, as I mentioned before. So there's a lot of reading on both, both sites in the further details if you become a member. So I, I look forward to seeing you, Jeff, down there and everybody else. And it's going to be a lot of fun and quite interesting. So thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. So check out all the stuff. We'll have the links all down below. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, <laughs> share. Uh, this video will probably just be going up just before Anarchapoco happens. Uh, but if you're watching it and it's still a few days away, uh, check out flights. There's a lot of super cheap flights thanks to uh, the uh, lower uh, price of oil, uh, the really bad economy, and now the Ebola two 2016, as I call it, Zika. It's the new thing to scare everybody <laughs> into not traveling. Uh, so there's a lot of cheap flights. So a lot of great people are going to be there like Kenneth and so many others. It's really going to be just an amazing week. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm trying to prepare for it now. Uh, so check out all that stuff and uh, really looking forward to seeing you, Kenneth, and getting more into this stuff. This is the first time I've really, you know, we've had over 240 episodes now and we've never talked about this angle of things. And uh, so this is the first time. So I'll be looking into it a lot more and uh, maybe we'll have you on again or talk more about this in the future. Uh, so that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. See ya. Thanks. See, our problem is we address symptoms all the time. We want to address the homelessness. We want to address the wars. We want to address the oil spills. We want to address the CSG. We want to address all these different issues. But they're all symptoms of, of legislation that's been put in place which has allowed these companies to rape the earth. And this legislation is put in place because we're disunited, we're not paying attention, and we believe our governments are our rulers when they're actually our employees. In 1972, uh, I watched my cousin, who was 25 at the time, die a horrible death from cancer. And then about three years later, when I was leaving, I worked at a hospital, and when I was leaving work that day, uh, there was an announcement, come on the radio, uh, the announcer was laughing like a fool, but it, he was stating that a research study that had been done in the U.S. had proved that THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, which I prefer to call cannabis, uh, had been found to kill cancer cells. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.